The title of this presentation, Developing Rhythmic Intelligence Towards a Critical Understanding of Educational Temporalities, uh, is actually the title of uh, an article that's going to be published in a couple of, in, uh, probably a month from now, in a special issue of the journal Sisyphus, edited by my dear colleague Sabine schmidt um, a special issue on time and adult education. But actually, I'm not going to discuss in detail the content of this article today because um, time would have been actually uh, missing. 45 minutes was probably not enough. So what I found more uh, maybe interesting and uh, stimulating to do with you was to try to share with you the background of this research, where it comes from, and also obviously where it leads in terms of uh, research and uh, agenda of research. So um, my presentation is going to be organized in three times. I'm going to discuss uh, the stages of development of my research on rhythmic intelligence, where that comes from, how it emerged uh, in my own life, professionally and personally. Uh, to some extent, um, and I will then in a second time uh, give a few in, um, indication about the definition I propose uh, today of this notion of rhythmic intelligence, knowing the fact that it's really a work in progress. So it's it's uh, it's a more uh, kind of an hypothesis for us to work together rather than just um, a clear cut concept that would be uh, clearly defined. And then I will end with a proposition for an agenda of research that I hope will also help us frame the reflection and the discussion throughout the entire symposium series. So the stages of development of my research on rhythmic intelligence. So I'm going to start with what I call the funding experiences. And in a way, um, for me, it started when I moved uh, from Geneva, Switzerland to New York. Uh, in 2003, as a visiting scholar at that time, eventually later I became a joint professor at Teachers College. Uh, that was both uh, an experience of professional transition, uh, although I was still working on my thesis at that time, and also a personal experience of migrating to another country. And as you can imagine, moving from one uh, middle-sized town to a big city in itself confronted to a lot of uh, different rhythms. But uh, what I experienced that was the most striking for me professionally, I, I called it retrospectively an experience of rhythmic dissonance. And I often refer to it in my, in my work because I had to adjust the work I was doing at the University of Geneva at that time where uh, semesters and classes were organized over a um, uh, longer period of time. At that time, it was uh, before the reform of Bologna. Uh, in higher education. So courses were organized around eight months, where when I arrived in the US, I had to teach uh, very similar seminars on a shorter period of time. Americans have a concept for that. They call that accelerated learning, uh, this idea of compressing um, the training time. And so for me, it was the experience of a rhythmic dissonance because I had to adjust the process and the content of what I used to do uh, to a new format and also a new culture, uh, because obviously the relation to time from students and colleagues uh, were different than uh, what I was used to. Um, and so specifically in my work, and I'm also going to say a few words about the content of my work here um, in higher education, which has to do with the use of life history and narrative approach. Uh, I'm working with participants, young adult and adult, um, on the life narrative and the life history, trying to explore with them um, informal, non-formal learning experience that are highlighted, that were formative and that appear um, through the uh, sharing of an oral and written life narrative. And so as you can imagine, it's a process that takes uh, a fair amount of time in order to build um, trust, confidence, uh, group dynamic in order to share those kind of experiences. And so I used to do that with Pierre de Minissé at the University of Geneva over a period of 
um, eight months at that time, which led time for things to unfold. And obviously, when you have to compress that in a time setting that is shorter, that raises a lot of questions about what to prioritize, what can be done, what cannot be done. And so this experience of rhythmic dissonance for me uh, was a strong learning experience that eventually started conceptualizing years later. Uh, I will mention that later. So an another aspect uh, that's related to uh, that experience of migrating to the US was also the fact that I had uh, my life for that period of time during approximately eight years before I, I came back to Switzerland was organized around uh, alternance uh, of living in the US but coming back to Europe. And so there was really two moments of my life that were emerging, the moment of living and walking in North America, but also living and walking in Europe, keeping in touch with family and friends, but also with colleagues. And that rhythmicity, that alternance, uh, traveling back and forth between uh, Europe and North America was a very formative experience. And I can say uh, with the distance of time that it was uh, really constitutive of uh, my professionalization as a researcher, of the process of building a professional identity, capitalizing on resources um, bo on both sides of the Atlantic. And so it triggers also re reflection and question about uh, those rhythms that are constitutive of our life, uh, that are, for example, emerging from alternance uh, between uh, different places, different sites, but also different networks, different uh, relations, and how those um, alternances are constitutive of learning uh, process, developmental process. In my case, they were constitutive of my professional development. And so some of those reflections started emerging um, throughout those years. The third funding experience uh, was, uh, was related to uh, the fact of becoming a parent, having children. My first child was born in 2012, the second one in 2015. And as you can imagine, that was transformational experiences. But what struck me as uh, I was experiencing becoming a parent, becoming a father, um, was related to the fact that it's not just something obviously that comes from one day to the next, just because the child is born, something really changed. It's obviously, a process that is inscribed in a duration. And, and uh, it triggered a lot of reflection for me about how the rhythmicity that goes with the fact we became parent uh, influenced the way we learn, the way we develop ourselves, and how we transform ourselves. So, um, in a way, uh, with my children, I, in a way, I could say I, be I started becoming a parent even before having children by just starting thinking about it. And that's something that comes up sometimes very early in life. But um, obviously once the children are there, they also change in rituals, in routines, in habits that uh, have transformational uh, dimensions and formative aspect. And a very concrete example has to do obviously when, especially in the early years, uh, when the life is quite repetitive with uh, young infant and children, um, something evolved that is really highly rhythmic, including in the interaction with the, the child and with the baby. But at the same time, things evolve day after day. And so transformation occur in a way uh, that is both uh, repetitive, but at the same time follow a movement made of variation, differences, emergences, and that's really an uh, aspect that uh, uh, are rhythmic features, and this idea of periodicity, repetition, but also the idea that there are patterns emerging through a movement that is not uh, fully regular. So becoming a parent was also a source of learning for me uh, and trigger uh, the desire to explore more the relation, the connection between learning, transformation, development, education, and rhythms.
I, you'll find at the end of the presentation a list of references and some of those experiences I wrote about later. Um, so um, you'll, you'll find eventually, if you're interested, um, articles and chapters uh, related to those uh, two experiences. So the second aspect, um, the relationship to time as a critical issue in adult education. Uh, as I was working on my doctoral research that was focusing on the concept of critique in education, um, I was brought to explicitly start inquiring about the connection between the idea of critique and the relation to time. So uh, I think there are two ways in a way to think about this connection. The first is that the exercise of critique, the exercise of what Jack Medzi will call critical self-reflection on assumptions, this time of you know, introspective time where you start challenging the assumptions you have, the way you give meaning to your experience, typically the kind of work we do in life history and, and um, seminars, you know, where we revisit past experience to revisit the way we give meaning to it. That's an activity that requires time. And so uh, I think today it's obviously a challenge for many people to find that time for exercising that critical reflection or that critical self-reflection. And so uh, there is really a, a, a critical aspect for us as educators to think about how can we protect, nurture the time we require for the exercise of critical reflection. At the same time, and that's the other aspect, uh, the experience of time is never neutral. Time is a locus of power dynamics. Uh, I used to say the act of slowing down in itself is a political act. So reflecting on the experience of time is also a way to think about uh, what's going on, about alienating dimension of the everyday life, as uh, Henri Lefebvre would say. Um, and so criticality today is also uh, grounded in the capacity to analyze and to understand what is at stake from a temporal perspective in the social reality we are experiencing. So there is really those two aspects that seems to me very uh, connected that are important for us to explore from a critical perspective. Another aspect that emerged at, uh, during that period in my work uh, using life history is the critical dimension of reflecting on one's own life um, history. And so there is, uh, here I, I will refer to two concepts, two notions introduced by colleagues who have really inspired me. Uh, first, notion of biographicity that the German sociologist of adult education, Peter Light, has introduced. Biographicity as this capacity to pilot one's own um, life, the capacity to develop a reflective way to uh, reinterpret one's own past experience in order to influence the way uh, we take decision, the way we position ourselves, the way we navigate our life. Um, and so, uh, my assumption here is that biographicity, this capacity to pilot our own life, require a capacity to regulate the rhythms of our life. And by that, I mean the capacity to um, sometimes accelerate, sometimes slow down, but definitely think about the patterns through which we develop ourselves. And I will develop a bit this idea later in this presentation. There is this idea also introduced by Gaston Pinault, who is among the first to have really explored explicitly that connection between adult education and rhythm theory. This concept of rhythmo formation that he suggests that is really connected with the use of life history, narrative approach as a way to um, bring people to think about and act on the rhythms that shape their life. And by rhythms here, I refer to the rhythms of the everyday life, the rhythms of our interaction with others, the rhythms of the way we move, the way we experience the world in our body through the alternance of night and day, uh, and um, also the rhythms of the discourses that we have, that we repeat, that we create uh, throughout our lives, including 
about ourselves. And so this idea of learning to regulate the temporalities and the rhythms of our own development is something that seems to me very critical and that emerged at that time. And connected to that, there is also this capacity to learn to negotiate also the antagonistic temporalities of our existence. I mean, that's something that is very ubiquitous today, the work-life balance, um, how we learn to negotiate those tensions, in adult education, that's a reflection that emerged already decades ago in literature on dual education and around the issue of alternance between professional settings and continuing education. Um, Philippe Mauban will discuss that matter actually in his presentation throughout the symposium. Um, and so there is something there also for adult educators to reflect on about how we negotiate those tensions between the educational settings and uh, the other areas of our lives that have their own rhythms that may be conflicting and competing with the rhythm of our educational processes. So at that time, I was starting developing those reflections through a course that I um, created at Teachers College that was called Time and Learning, Developing the Rhythm of Empowerment. That was a way for me to explore also interdisciplinary literature around rhythm theory and time theory in social science in human science, in biology, in psychology, in anthropology, and so on, in order to find resources to enrich our understanding of the temporal dimension that uh, inform and influence our everyday life. All that led progressively to um, um, a milestone in, in my um, uh, trajectory or in my uh, pathway that was the writing of a book titled Time and the Rhythms of Emancipatory Education. Um, this book, uh, I, I met with uh, Gerd Biesta in 2013, it was in Berlin, and we discussed about my interest for this topic and he suggested me to write this book for a collection that he was uh, directing um, with Rutledge. And so I worked for three years on the writing of this book that was for me the opportunity to try to formalize a bit some of my assumption, but also explore the literature on the topic. And I do believe that it's probably among the most exhaustive books on the topic of time and education from a critical perspective that integrate uh, literature found in English speaking, French speaking, and to some extent, German speaking uh, literature. Unfortunately, it's obviously limited to Western um, uh, perspective, uh, which is a major limitation of this book, but at that time, uh, that was part of the constraint uh, that I had to face. So in this book, I, I've tried to do three things. The first one to, was to, really to, to try to reflect on the specificity of thinking about time in educational sciences. Uh, there is something specific that I think distinguish educational sciences from other disciplines such as sociology or psychology is that by definition educational sciences are uh, interdisciplinary field of study and so when we are dealing with students with learners we are dealing with rhythms that are biological rhythms that have to do with the capacity of uh, uh, being attentive uh, at a specific time, developing attention, which has to do also with psychological rhythm. I mean, biological and psychological rhythm are related, but also obviously social rhythms that have to do with the temporalities of the institution we are working in, whether it's in school, in higher education, or in professional development. And so there is a specificity to think about time uh, in education, that is that we need to be able to inform our practice based on what's existing. And there's been a fair amount of literature, obviously on time studies in different disciplines, but there is also a specificity. And, and I think that should be also the core of the reflection we have when we think about uh, the time and the rhythms of adult education. Uh, second aspect of that research was to try to track back and build a genealogy of how we um, how we think about the connection between time, rhythm, and the institution of education. And there is a history of uh, the temporalities of education uh, that I describe in this book. 
to also try to better understand the specificity of the period we are living in, uh, which is, in my opinion, characterized by uh, um, the experience of discontinuity, the experience of disjointed temporalities, and therefore that raise new challenges from an educational perspective, which is how do we learn to um, um, organize, to connect, to keep coherence between the different times of our lives, whether it's family time, work time, uh, the time of citizenship and social commitment and so on. And so tracking back the history of the relation between time rhythms and um, education was a way also to try to understand better uh, the tension we are experiencing today. And finally, the, the last um, contribution of that book is to really try to initiate a theory of um, emancipation that is informed by a theory of time and rhythm. And so I suggest to envision emancipation, not as a stage that we would just uh, aim at or, or reach one day at some point in our life, but more something that we nurture, that we sustain, and that has a rhythmic component. And so I developed this idea that our life is built around tensions between autonomy and dependence. And there is a rhythm between those two polarities of our life. And somewhere it's also, it could be the aim of a critical pedagogy or critical education to help people uh, find their own rhythms in the way they regulate their life and the way they reach um, or they um, increase uh, the experience of uh, emancipation. So I explored the idea that emancipation uh, built up on the repetition of specific patterns. Uh, and in the, in the book, I analyze uh, life history showing how patterns of transgression built up very early in life and eventually uh, can be uh, nurtured in adulthood uh, to feed a movement of emancipation. So this reflection formalized and, and progressively led me to my interest for rhythm analysis, which I'm going to turn to now. Just for information also, for those who do not read English, some of uh, the contribution of these books were also published uh, as articles and chapters, and you'll find them in the reference list. So false point conceived, conceiving leave transformation as rhythmic processes. Um, as I've been working at Teachers College, uh, as you may know, that's the home of uh, Jack Medzio's work on transformative learning theory. So my interest for transformational theories in adult education was so important. And so thinking about emancipatory process obviously is connected to the way we think about transformative processes throughout one's life. And so as much as I'm keen and, and, and um, um, I embrace uh, Medieval's contribution. I also um, nurture a critical uh, relation to, to that contribution because I think that the temporalities of transformational processes remain a tacit dimension of his contribution. There is more to do to understand better how transformation develops through time. And so the interest of the concept of rhythm is that it also allowed to think um, uh, and explore that connection between the continuities and the discontinuities of one's life. As you may know, transformative the learning theory put the stress, the importance of uh, what Medivo called disorienting dilemmas, those experiences that may be sometimes uh, related to crisis or definitely disturbing events that um, impact our life and have ripples. Um, and so what I've tried to uh, develop in my research is the fact that although those events have a critical role in our lives, they are often related to lower intensity experiences that have a rhythmic component. And so I've explored that in different texts since then, but that's still a path of research for me to try to explore more what's the connection between transformation and rhythm. More recently, uh, triggered by the experience of the COVID pandemics, um, I also uh, started exploring the concept of crisis from a rhythmic perspective. And so I published recently in the journal of published by the ESREA, by the European Society of Research in Education of Adults, 
uh, Zella. In this journal, uh, a special issue coordinated by uh, Danny Wildemersch on the idea of crisis. And so um, what I've tried to explore then was this idea that crises are often perceived at a time where people implement you know, defense mechanism, um, experience rigidity in order to maintain a feeling of cohesion and protect themselves around the threat that a crisis can manifest, whether it's a, a pandemic or whether it's a family crisis or professional crisis. In this paper, I was trying to explore another component of the experience of crisis that has to do with the fluidity of experience, the fact that usually what makes a crisis problematic, but at the same time, an opportunity is that everything is up and up. Uh, there is possibilities that emerge during time of crisis. And so this tension between fluidity and rigidity is a feature, is a rhythmic feature of the experience of crisis. And I, I think there is uh, more to, to explore about the rhythmic component of crisis. I mean, with the pandemics we saw, so with the successive waves of contamination that we've experienced throughout the world, uh, some rhythmic features of that phenomenon that also had an impact on the way lear people learn and develop themselves. And so that's something that I've explored in that uh, article which led me progressively to being more interested in the process of transition. And more recently, I've committed to a collective process of research um, that's focusing on social and ecological transition. Um, and uh, here again, I think that there would be a lot to learn about um, the issue of sustainability, the issue of environmental transition from a rhythmological perspective. Um, because beyond the idea of uh, avoiding the threshold of catastrophe, you know, of ecological catastrophe, we need to think about how we sustain our behaviors, our way of thinking, uh, our way of relating with each other. And sustaining behaviors and way of thinking over time is something that is inscribed in rhythm. So that's where also I saw strong connection with um, what I'm interested in now with rhythmic intelligence. So again, some of those uh, reflections have been published and uh, you'll find references here if you're interested to follow up on those reflections. I see the time is running, so I'm going to try to wrap up. So um, all those reflections, those different uh, topics, those different areas led me to develop my curiosity, my interest for uh, rhythm analysis and rhythm analytical approach. And here I'm just building up, sitting on the shoulders of GNs or people who preceded us. Among them, and I cannot refer to everyone here obviously, but people like Gaston Bachelard, French philosopher from the early 20th century, uh, Henri Lefebvre, sociologist and philosopher from the mid 20th centuries, who have explored this idea of rhythm analysis, this idea of focusing on the rhythm of existence, whether from a psychological perspective or from a social perspective, to try to better understand the realities we are experiencing. This idea that we could develop a method to better understand the rhythms we are experiencing that can be embodied rhythms, the rhythms of our bodies, the rhythms of our movement, um, it can be discursive rhythms, the rhythms of uh, dialogue, exchanges, uh, conversation, obviously psychological rhythms in the way of thinking or moods or emotions also fluctuate throughout the time, throughout the everyday life and throughout the life course. So this idea of rhythm analysis is fascinating, but one of the big problems is that there's not been that much written on it. Uh, and therefore there is a lot to create a lot to imagine, a lot to envision, to develop what it could look like to practice such kind of rhythm analysis, to develop that capacity to reflect on rhythms in a critical way so that we can influence them, so that we can um, regulate them. The, the master word for me is regulation when we think about rhythm. 
So that led me to work uh, philosophically also on the influence of processual approaches. There is a long tradition of writing on uh, process philosophy that can give some background to think about how we conceptualize, how we think about rhythm and processes in, in our life. But more recently, and that's also the topic of this uh, presentation here, it led me to start thinking about two notions in particular, the notion of rhythmic unconscious and the notion of rhythmic intelligence. So just a few words about rhythmic unconscious. Um, that's something that really emerged as I was nurturing, taking care of my children when they were very young. I was thinking about those periods where every night, you know, having to put them to bed, but sometimes they were crying, you know, kind of a bit of never ending time of nurturing them, but being myself exhausted and this kind of repetitive aspect to it that, you know, uh, was at the same time pleasant, painful, challenging. Let me a lot of time to think as I was also taking care of them. But this idea that, you know, I mean, they are uh, 10 and eight years old now. I totally forgot the details of those long nights having to keep them in my arms and, you know, trying to make them sleep. So there is something with the experience of repetition that we tend to forget. I mean, there is something with the way our memory works that we tend to keep track mainly of key events, uh, disruption, discontinuities, rather than the repetitive, monotonous aspect of our life. And I think there is something there that goes in the background of our memory that becomes unconscious, not necessarily in the way psychoanalysis um, deal with unconscious, not necessarily through repression, but more just because it's not adaptive to necessarily keep track of those memories. But our lives are made of repetition and of the reproduction of situations that are self-similar. And so when we work on life history, we put the stress on key events um, that have punctuated our life, and we tend to neglect what I call the rhythmic unconscious, those repetition that are also part of who we are and what we become. And so I think there is really something about working on, on those aspects of, the, of, of one's life because there are source of learning there. Which led me finally to this notion of rhythmic intelligence. I took my time to get there. When I was working, trying to see how can we develop a praxis related to rhythm analysis? How can I work with the people I'm doing life history work, for example, or biographical coaching with? How can I introduce this idea of rhythm in my work? And so uh, as I was working on that, I was thinking that the problem is that we need first to name, to qualify what we are trying to develop. What, what, is, what are the, the skills, what are the knowledge require to think about, to, to, to reflect on rhythms? And that's where the idea of rhythmic intelligence emerged because I had to find a name to qualify uh, what has to be developed in order to uh, be able to be in touch and to be critical about the experience of rhythm. And so for the last few years, I've developed, I've started developing this idea and, and also collectively. And now um, we have been forming a group recently with a, uh, uh, Fadia Daka and Gael Negro, uh, called Graduate Research Group on Rhythmic Intelligence with doctoral students from the University of uh, Birmingham. Um, we are trying to also multiply uh, opportunities for people to reflect around what goes into the use and the development of rhythm analysis, rhythm formation, and the development of knowledge, skills, capacity, sensitivity in a way for uh, rhythmic phenomena. So I have a few minutes left before we open the dialogue. I'm going to just say a few more words about this idea of rhythmic intelligence to try to define it a bit more. Um, and here um, I basically share with you uh, some uh, ideas that were formalized in this paper that's going to be published next month. Um, the idea is that uh, when, we, when you think about the, the idea, the, the concept of or the, the term intelligence, it's referred to basically three understanding. Uh, intelligence as a capacity to understand, to comprehend phenomena. Intelligence as an adaptive 
uh, strategic capacity and intelligence as a capacity to be uh, relating with, to be in relation, in close relation with one's environment. So for me, the notion of rhythmic intelligence refers to the individual and collective ability to know, understand, and represent the rhythmic dimensions inherent in any organized, observed, or experienced phenomenon. And I want to put the stress here on the fact that I really do not privilege a conception of intelligence that would be privileging strictly cognitive dimension. Obviously, it's part of it, but it's not the only part of it, especially when we think about rhythmic phenomena, the capacity to feel rhythms, to sense uh, rhythm, including aesthetically, uh, plays an important role. And this capacity is not just an individual capacity, it's also a collective capacity. So when we work within a group, uh, being sensitive about what's going on in the group dynamic also requires some form of collective intelligence uh, to sense the rhythms that are um, uh, in the room, that are um, part of how we interact with each other. So for me, it's important to consider rhythmic intelligence not just strictly as an individual capacity or ability, but also a collective one. A second aspect is that it refers to concrete or symbolic modalities of apprehension of the real, which integrate and go beyond discursive and logical aspect. Obviously, language is crucial. Uh, obviously, um, logics is important, but rhythmic intelligence is not strictly and only discursive and logical per se. It also convoke uh, symbols, metaphors, other way of relating to the imaginary we have of time and changes in our life. It's also often embodied, and a lot of what has been done in rhythm and education, especially in rhythmic education in the early 20th centuries, has to do with this embodied dimension, uh, how we experience rhythm through music, but also through the senses of movement and dance, for instance. So again, rhythmic intelligence is not strictly a cognitive, does not strictly refer to cognitive aspect, but also to embodied and symbolic dimension of one's life. It refers to a capacity of adaptation and problem solving, which implies an ability to feel and act in order to influence the rhythms that make up the physical living and human environment in which it is exercised in a deliberate, strategic, and critical manner. And so for me, two important track here relate to biographicity, as I mentioned it earlier, how we can strategically influence the rhythms that are constitutive of the way we evolve, develop ourselves, transform ourselves, but also collectively. How do we learn to regulate, to think about, but also to influence social changes that are inscribed in long durations or which involve conflicting temporalities as it is the case, for example, with environmental uh, changes and social transitions. Changes, transformational processes that are highly complex and therefore involve different rhythms, different temporalities that are conflicting with each other and require actors to be able to learn to develop the capacity to regulate and eventually strategize priorities to regulate rhythms to privilege. So it refers to a capacity to establish also and explore the relations and the connection that characterize the dynamics and processes through which complex phenomena are organized. I'm very, in my work, influenced by the work of Edgar Morin, the French philosopher, who developed his uh, uh, reflection on complexity theory and the paradigm of complexity and who also articulate this idea of uh, intelligence de la complexité, which is a capacity to put in connection in relations um, uh, phenomena beyond uh, the understanding uh, we have that is limited by uh, disciplinary uh, compartmentalization. So there is really something also transdisciplinary um, uh, that is fundamental for the development of rhythmic intelligence, capacity to relate phenomena that are involving biological, 
processes, psychological processes, social processes, and so on. And so finally, the idea of intelligence also refers to that capacity to relate, to enter in relation, to nurture relation with one's environment. So for me, rhythmic intelligence refers to the development of a privileged relationship with a given environment. It thus presuppose an ability to enter into resonance with others and with natural and social phenomena likely to increase the quality and understanding of the lived experience. And here recently, someone like Hartmut Rosa, as you, that you may have heard about, sociologist, German sociologist who write extensively about the concept of acceleration. Uh, his, one of his last book was about resonance. Although it does not refer explicitly to rhythm theory, the concept of resonance is highly rhythmic by definition. So this I, I, ability to uh, nurture the rhythms through which we can develop a high quality relation with others and with one's own surrounding. So for me, those aspects are part, and they are not exhaustive, obviously, but they are part of what I identify as rhythmic intelligence. So just to conclude my presentation, as we are getting uh, to the time, I will just finish by um, sharing with you just five axes of research that I think um, are uh, ways to envision um, the next step in terms of developing research, developing um, also praxis in order to help us understand what is at stake in the way we relate to time in education and through education. And I hope maybe that those five axes will help us also understand what is at stake in the following presentation in this webinar series. The first one has to do with how we conceive the critical aims inherent to the development of rhythmic intelligence. For me, it's absolutely crucial to think rhythmic intelligence from a critical perspective. Uh, what does it involve uh, in the way we discriminate, the way we interpret, the way we evaluate, the way we judge, the way we argue, the way we challenge the experiences that we are living? A second axe has to do with how we envision from a rhythmological perspective the environment within which rhythmic intelligence is exercised. Typically, if I refer to um, social transition, um, what is the understanding we have of the rhythm involved in social phenomena such as a pandemic or such as an environmental crisis? So there is a, a walk to gather also in terms of research, in terms of uh, reinforcing our understanding of how rhythms are everywhere uh, in our realities. And, and that's one of the key challenges of research on rhythm is that rhythms are everywhere. So we tend to see them and take them for granted where there is a real work of how we conceptualize, how we theorize, how we formalize the rhythms that are constitutive of our uh, social life and also individual lives. How to envision the effect of developing rhythmic intelligence among individuals and collectivities. And here again, I refer mainly to this idea of biographicity, how rhythm analysis could help people navigate their professional life, their personal life, the relation between their professional and personal lives and uh, uh, develop their biographicity, their capacity to develop agency in the way they regulate the rhythms that are constitutive of their life including collectively. Fourth axis, how to conceive the complexity of learning, transformational and developmental processes that rhythmic intelligence help grasping. And I think here I was mentioning transformative learning theory as a key referential to think about transformation in adult education. I think we need to develop more uh, in terms of contribution that help understand the complexity of the temporal dynamics through which people learn transform and develop themselves. And there are strong connections that needs to be established between complexity theories, transformation theory, and rhythm theories. Uh, an example here, which for me is very important, the importance of non-linearity. Non-linearity refers to uh, complex phenomena that can be very quiet for a while and then trigger a strong reaction at some point. Um, and so typically the study of nonlinearity in physics could be, is very helpful to understand also such phenomena 
in, uh, in among human beings and, and transformational process, including in adult education. And I think written theory can help us enrich also the understanding of such uh, phenomena and how we envision development, transformation, and, and learning processes. And finally, how to define a praxis centered on the analysis of the rhythmic dimensions of experience. I call it a clinical rhythm analysis to distinguish it a bit from the rhythm analytical project from Lefebvre that is more kind of uh, um, sociological take on the idea of rhythm analysis, but we could discuss that. Uh, this idea that it's a praxis that's at the same time a research praxis, but also a praxis that is educational that may help people develop themselves. And what are the tools, what are the concepts, the methods, the techniques in a way even that we could use. And here, um, I guess for me, the influence of psychoanalysis is very important and we could develop such an approach. I'm going to stop here so that we have enough time for the conversation. You have more resources there and the PowerPoint is available on Padlets. You have the link and we'll send it to you again. And if you're interested to continue the reflection and the discussion beyond this symposium, feel free to connect through uh, social networks or other resources for us to keep in touch. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to discussing with you in the remaining time.